open source projects. Recently, his interest in test-driven development turned into Testability Explorer and JS Test Driver, with which he hopes to change the testing culture of the open source community. If everyone can put your hands together and welcome Mishko Hereri. Howard, you're too kind with the words here. So thank you all for coming. Uh, uh, we're going to talk about something different today. Uh, I want to talk about psychology of testing. Rather than talking about how to do the testing, or we're more interested in what is actually going through our head when we are confronted with, uh, with writing a test and how we look at this particular thing. So hopefully it's going to be a little bit of different. Um, I love questions, so please ask as many as you want. And to encourage questions, we have a little bit of swag that uh, Igor over here will help to hand out. So for good questions, we'll give swag. Um, so do ask. Don't wait for the Q&A session at the, at the end. Uh, OK, let's get started. So I like to, I rather, my boss always like to say, testing is not like frosting, meaning that you can't bake sh a, a cake without sugar and then decide that you're just going to frost the cake on the, uh, after the fact. Like, it just doesn't taste right, right? You've got to put the sugar in the process of baking. And so it works the same way for testing as well. You can't just build your project and then assume that after the fact, you're going to like sprinkle on some tests and then everything is going to be nice and fine. Because it doesn't work. It just doesn't work after the fact. So let's look at how we actually build code. Uh, and I think whether you do testing or not, this is basically how everybody does it, right? The red area is where you put the bugs in. And then the green area is where you take the bugs out, right? I mean, that's kind of how it works. And it's, it's an endless cycle. Like, whether you do test-driven or whether you do manual, you code for a bit, and then you try it. Like, you can maybe code for half an hour max, but after that, like, you got to try whatever you coded up because sooner or later, like, you're just going to get yourself lost. Like, it's an iterative process whether you like it or not. And at some point, you decide, yeah, it's a good thing, and I'm going to check it in, right? But the thing is, is the green box, and that is that we do it manually, or a lot of us do it manually, and we would like to transition to do it automatically. And so the difference is writing your test, or rather deciding what you're about to uh, implement and then writing a little scenario, a little story about it, and then implementing it. And we'll talk about that later. So the whole trick is how do we transition from us doing the test to a machine doing the test for us? And so the way most people kind of look at it is they kind of do this. Uh, so they say, well, we'll put the bugs in over here, and then we expect that we're going to have some kind of a QA folks that it's not our problem, right? It's like software engineers, we write the code, and then somebody else's problem is to kind of make find our bugs after us. Uh, and then at some point, people will say, well, the whole QA, manual QA doesn't really work out, so we got to have some kind of automated tests. And so at this level, uh, people are always looking for some kind of magic. Like, ooh, if only we bought some software X, and all of our testing problems will go away. And there's lots and lots of companies that do this, and it never works. And the reason is it's too late at that particular point in time. There's another problem with this picture, and that is that the pre people who put the bugs in are not the people who feel the pain. And unless you have the closed circle, unless you feel your own misery, you're never going to learn and get better at this particular thing. So the magic to testing is not here. It's up here. It has to happen uh, up there. If you do this right, everything else will just fall automatically in place. And so we'll talk about this uh, a little more. Uh, so the funny thing is you, you, you come to an engineer and you say, why don't you write a test? And they always have some kind of a beautiful excuse for you. And usually it, it, it goes you know, a long list. I'm not going to go into individual details uh, as to what all these excuses are. But one thing that nobody ever says is, I don't know how. That's the valid excuse. You know, just say, I don't know how. Like, it's perfectly valid, right? I mean, if I come to you and say, do you know JavaScript? You can say no, and, you know, it's not shameful to say that I don't know a particular language, but somehow it is shameful to say, I don't know how to write a test. And why is that? It's a skill like any other thing, right? You could say, do you know how to ski? And it's not shameful to say, no, I don't ski. But somehow, as engineers, it's kind of programming into our head, of course I know how to write a test. Nobody ever says they don't know how. And really, this is the reason why most tests don't get written, is that writing tests is a skill uh, like any other skill, and you have to learn it uh, like you learn all other skills. It's not innate to the whole process. So let me demonstrate this thing. This is my favorite interview question uh, when I do interviews at uh, Google. I say, suppose you're an evil engineer. 
and you want to make hard to write code. I'm uh, sorry, hard to test code. What do you do? It's an open question to all of you guys. What do you do? Yes. Okay, so you've been reading my blog. Good. <laughs> yes. Oh. He, he said put singletons everywhere. A global state. Uh, in other words. Uh, what about, uh, so I'll give the gentleman some swag. <laughs> to motivate. Yes. Yes, put new operators everywhere, okay. Hard code dependencies, it's, it's a different way of saying put news everywhere, yeah. Lots of static methods, this cannot be overwritten. Yeah, that's general just complexity, right? Right, so it, that's an interesting statement. So in, a lot of people say that on an interview, that, oh, just make it really complicated. And while it is true that that makes it hard to test, it doesn't, that in itself doesn't um, fundamentally prevent testing. It just makes it miserably difficult, right? Yeah, Whereas, yes, it makes it miserably difficult. Very difficult yes, yes. Whereas new operators, fundamentally make it impossible, right? That's the kind of the difference that I'm going here. But excellent, I mean, you guys know a lot of good points. Um, I, I get a lot of blank stares. People are not quite sure what they're, what do I mean by this particular question. But I figured that if you know how to write hard to test code, then you probably know how to avoid it, right? So uh, let's talk about a little less theory and a little more hands-on. So I'm gonna have some examples to go through. and. Yeah, this is kind of hard to see, but I was kind of hoping that some of you would have computers and you could just go to this URL and actually see the code. Uh, but it doesn't matter. We'll, we'll go through them in, in more in-depth in particular thing. So usually in an interview, I present the candidate with a uh, piece of code, something similar to this, and I say, pretend you have to write a test. And specifically, I'm interested in um, what would you change about this code in order to make this testable? And I mean, you're squinting, and there's going to be slides that are zoomed in a little more, so, so don't worry about it just yet. The interesting thing about this question is that everybody immediately takes the piece of paper and you know, sticks their nose into it and tries to understand what the code does. And this is interesting because why would you think that knowing how to write a test is related to knowing what the code do, does? In other words, whether or not um, piece of code is easy to test is a function of structure of that code. It's not a function of what the code does. And this is something that people uh, don't seem to understand. You're gonna say something? Yeah, the problem is a lot of code bases don't have mission statement effects that are simple to understand. They attempt to make the code attempt to be the spec. Yes. Right. Right. So the message I'm trying to say here is that um, when when you're presented with a piece of code uh, and you're trying to say how can I test this, don't try to understand what the code does. That's really a secondary problem. Rather, look for how the code is structured, and it's something that you can train your eye to do uh, over time. And I'm going to show you what I look for when I see a piece of code and how I really don't think that what the code actually does is relevant to this question. So this particular code is designed to slap you around. It's uh, the most e evil piece of code I could think of. Uh, and uh, from, I was really inspired over the years of looking at other people's code and also mine, especially if I go back in history. Uh, so there are a couple of red flags that I look for and I think um, you know, we should learn to recognize as a software engineering industry is global state and singleton. Somebody already pointed that out. Law of the mirror violations, and I'll have an examples of why that's a problem. Global references to time, because really time is a global function that changes underneath you all the time. Uh, Hard-coded new operators, and just the general lack of dependency injection, or really dependency management. So let's do an exercise. That is, assume the code is fixed, right? This is where most people, uh, when, when they first come to testing, they have this assumption, oh, code is already written, I've done all my work. And now I'm going to go and try to write a test, 
right? And so I take this attitude that the code is perfect. I'm just trying to write some tests on top of it, right? And that, what I'm trying to say is that really this is the wrong attitude to look at when it comes to writing code. So, but it, for this exercise, let's just assume for a second that the code is fixed, and we're going to try to do our best effort in writing a test for it. And in the process, we're going to identify problems with it. And then maybe, hopefully, on the end, we'll suggest some refactoring. So hopefully, this is a little more zoomed in. The part on the left is, uh, is the code that I'm looking for, and then the part on the right is, is the test case. I'm going to try to write a test. Keep in mind that this is what would the world look like if we assume that the code is fixed, and we're just trying to write a test, and this code is specifically badly written to make testing really, really difficult. So the first thing I look for is the static keyword, uh, because that tells me that there's global state. Now, what does it mean? What it means in test is if there is a static keyword here, that means I only get a single chance at instantiating this thing in my test system, right? Because it's a, once the inbox syncer is instantiated, I can't make a new one because it's final, right? It's a good old singleton. Which means my test setup will have to have some kind of like, if you're not initialized, initialize it. And the trouble with that is, you really don't know when that class gets initialized. You're hoping that you are the first class to reference this thing, but you have no idea. So this is a big assumption whether we can even do this in our test. Uh, but nevertheless, it will kind of break down to this thing. Let's see, what else the next piece over there? Uh, referencing to more global state over here. Uh, the next thing I look at is a constructor, and I say, well, looks like I need a certificate, but I need to read it from it looks like some config object that I have to pass some path property that I have to indirect look up and then read the, the certificate from the file system. So the equivalent on the other side from the test point of view is, well, you gotta generate a certificate, you gotta create a temporary file, you gotta write the file somewhere, uh, close the output stream, and then you're hoping that the configuration object is writable. Now, given that this, whoever wrote this piece of code was paranoid, Chances are he was also paranoid here, which means this assumption I'm making that I can actually modify the configuration object might be outside of the scope of what's actually possible in that code base. Uh, so that might be troublesome as well. So here the next piece is, you know, I'm getting a user, username, and password. And in order to do this, I'm going to have to, let's see, uh, create a user object. And here's another big question mark is, can you actually instantiate a user without any arguments? Like it could be that the user requires a whole bunch of other things. For example, the person could have decided the user's constructor takes a servlet in order to get a hold of the cookie in order to initialize itself from the cookie, right? Uh, if that was the case, then instantiating the user would get really, really difficult. So here I'm making a big assumption that the user is going to be actually easy to instantiate. I'm going to put the username and password in there, and I'm going to be able to set it on a config. Again, these are all assumptions that one would have to make in order to write this test. And these are really tough assumptions to swallow. Uh, what else is in there? So then when you do all this, the next piece of code I look for is, these are your true dependencies almost, uh, usually. Not always, uh, but usually the true dependencies are the, <laughs> the fields that you have stored in your object. And therefore, uh, those are the things that you should, that you will want to mock and, uh, and inject. But that's not actually what you're asking for inside of the constructor. In other words, you're pretending that what you need in order to get your work done is the configuration object. But the reality is you need all this other stuff, and you are actually going to go look for stuff, right? So I always like to say, um, ask for what you need. Don't look for things. This is what I mean by that. Like, you should be really asking for the certificate, username, and password directly rather than looking for all these things. So look at all the code that we have written over here. That's actually quite a lot of code to just get through the constructor. And the constructor is something that we need to do all the time when we're testing. So let's go further. So now here's the sync method that we want to test. And again, um, there's new operators here, but this is a tough one. It's going to say make something called pop connector, doesn't matter what it is. And it's just going to connect to and disconnect, which means we probably have some socket communication going on. So in our setup method, we're probably going to have to create a server because there is no way to give you a fake connector over here because there's a new operator here, right? So I can't instantiate something else for you over there. So in order to test this, I actually have to have a kind of a fake server, which is going to have real, you know, TCP IP stack to get, get up and running. And then hopefully in teardown, I will be able to shut it down, which is also usually a big question with servers, whether you can actually shut them down. So I think these are just 
assumption after assumption after assumption I'm making that if everything else is written in the correct way, then maybe I can test this untestable piece of code if I just jump through all these hoops, right? But the reality is, if this piece of code is not written well, chances are the rest of the system isn't written well either, which means many of these assumptions I've made over here are probably false and will probably require a lot more code to get this thing tested. Right, so, paying attention? Did we forget anything? No, well, we, we haven't written the test yet. This is just a setup, right? We're just trying to get through the new operator so that we actually get an instance of this thing. So when you survive that crazy setup we just went through, then maybe you can write a test that actually does something. Um, and what's interesting, when people write test after the fact, they'll usually say, test sync. It's usually a dead giveaway. Uh, what exactly does that mean? Does this tell you a story of what you're trying to do? Like, it doesn't really tell a story here, right? You're just, you were told by somebody, go test that class. You saw that that class had a single method called sync, so you made a test called test sync. And then you hacked at it until you were able to get something to execute, and then you said, well, I'm executing stuff, and uh, looks like I've got some coverage, so ship it. So here's another mental exercise. Now that you have written this test, which is a little scary, could you reconstruct your project if I deleted your source code? That is, you get to keep your tests, but the production code is gone. Would you be able to, de de uh, would you be able to reconstruct your code base? And I'm going to say you're going to have a really, really hard time. And the reason for that is tests like these, they don't tell a story. They say, if you do all this set of crazy things, then the following set of crazy things should be true. But like, they don't seem to be related. Why is it that I have to be writing certificates to this special file and setting these global variables? And like, it's not, there's no rhyme or reason to this thing. So uh, let's see if we can flip it around. So before we can flip it around, I'm going to say tests are so yesterday. It's all about the executable specs. And executable specs are just tests with syntactic sugar. And sugar is always good. It makes things taste better. So how many of you guys have heard about specs? All right, good. You like them? Very. Really? What language are you familiar with the specs in? Ah, I don't mean that kind of specs. I mean like specs as an executable test in our specs. Well, I'll show you an example in a second. Who else ra raised their hands? And do you like specs over tests? Yes. You're obvious, okay. So we're talking the same language. Yes. Yes, BDD is another fancy word for this stuff. Uh, it's just, uh, I mean, people laugh that BDD is really just testing done right. Um, so let's change our assumptions here. And that is, assume the code we're about to test is yet to be written, right? Uh, and the other thing assumption I want to do is that you want to demonstrate a single behavior per spec. Or rather, to put it differently, we want each test to tell a story, right? Imagine I try to explain to you what a particular product does. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a lot of, give you a lot of examples. Like you'll say, oh, if you do this, this, and that, and this is going to happen. And then if you do this other set of things, and this other things is going to happen. And then what you, what humans are really good for is that if I give you a series of examples of how something works, humans are really good about generalizing. So if I say, you know, it does the following set of things and the following of things and the following, then you say, ah, it's a car, right? But if the other way around, it doesn't work so well. If I come to you and I say, you know, it's a sinker for email, and you're like, ah, it's too general of abstract thing. I don't really know what it means concretely. So what, what it means to tell a story is that I give you a whole bunch of examples that demonstrate how the piece of code work. Let me uh, show you that. So the biggest difference, and this is Java, and the Java's BDD is a little, uh, not, not as good as, for example, Ruby's BDD, or, or in JavaScript there is Jasmine that has pretty good BDD syntax. But the basic idea is that you want to tell a story. And so you're saying, it should sync messages from pop since last sync. Ah, that's a story. Like, I understand what it means. It's much better than saying test sync. It should close the connection even when an exception happens. I, I understand what that means, and I understand how to code that, right? Uh, it should sync message only when not already in the inbox, right? So these are the specifications of what the particular 
code should do, and then we fill in those specifications with little stories to demonstrate this particular scenario. So let me give you an example. Uh, so it should think message from pop really means something like that. I'm going to create a pop uh, class. I'm going to add two messages to it. Then I'm going to create my syncer, whatever that means. Uh, I'm going to pass in all the dependencies, like pop, inbox, filter, when was the last time I synced. Uh, and then I'm going to say sync now. And then I'm going to assert that the particular message actually got copied, but there's two messages I put in, but only one got copied because one was already synced because it was after a particular date. Right? The test like this tells a story. And the other thing that this test does is notice that it's much easier to follow. There isn't all this distraction about writing, creating certificates and writing them to temporary locations and then cleaning them up and starting servers and you know, all, the, all just distractions with giving, telling a story. So you want to make sure that these are uh, short, you know, they fit on a page, and they're easy to read. And, and uh, to me, that's really what specs are, little stories like that. So maybe another story would be uh, you know, test that it should close a connection even when an exception happens. So here again, uh, I can create a filter that throws an exception. And I can simulate an exception throwing uh, because when I try to sync, I expect to catch it. Again, I'm telling a story. And something like this wouldn't be possible if we already have written our implementation and had new operators everywhere, which most people have. Uh, so notice another thing, that if you do this right, there usually isn't a setup method, right? There is really no, setup method is needed because you need to execute some complicated piece of code, right? Which maybe has some if statements, loops, or something like that. Uh, all we're doing here is we're instantiating an object and wiring them together. And as a result, your setup is essentially just declaring your fields. And these fields actually become part of your language. They become kind of like a DSL. Right? So now your test reads nicely because you can say, uh, let's see, right, you have these things like long ago, past, now, future, uh, inbox filter, long ago message, past message, current message. And then if you're trying to write a test, let me back up a second, like over here, uh, notice that you could say add message long ago, add message, past message. And then when I do a sync, I say sync now, or, or last time I sync was long ago, so that it reads more like, uh, uh, I'm, I'm trying to create DSL. You know what DSL stands for? Dynamic uh, domain-specific language, do you understand what I'm trying to get at? So you want to make sure that you're, you really tell a story with these things. Now, I can do all of this is because none of the code was actually written yet. I'm just making it up. And it's easy to make stuff up. And the other thing is, if I'm making this stuff up, uh, nobody really in their right mind will start making crazy things up like, oh, let me start a server. Let me write a bunch of things to a file system. Let me create some obscure global variable that I said, right? Y you don't think that way. You create the most simple scenario that you can think of because creating complicated scenarios is a lot of effort, right? And nobody really uh, wants to do that. So writing the test before the code is uh, written really allows you to just think about it in a really pure form and then worry about how these pieces get together wired up later. So given these specs, let's write an implementation. And so here's an example of what an implementation would look like. Uh, and the first thing, what do you notice? What's the difference between the previous one? Uh, maybe. It's about the same, I think. But more importantly, uh, with the exception of the new date, uh, there is really no, uh, no new operators here. The date is kind of an exception because it's kind of a value object. It's like concatenating strings. It doesn't really count. Um, and I'm really not creating a date from global timer. I'm really passing in the date because it's being passed in. So it's kind of an exception here. But in general, you don't have um, new operators. So for example, the most important is that the pop connector, which was actually the thing that connected the server, is now passed in from the outside so that I can pass in a fake implementation if I choose to. So when you look at code like this, the thing that I always look for is I either want to see a whole bunch of new operators and no if statements or loops, or a whole bunch of if statements but no new operators. Uh, because I either want to see code that's a factory, in which case I'm wiring things together and I'm not doing any work, or 
I'm doing work, in which case somebody else is responsible for wiring process. Because if I mix the two together, then I'm going to have a really hard time writing a test. The other thing you're going to notice is that a good constructor looks like this. And that is, list your dependencies. Unfortunately, in Java, we have to do this three times. We have to list your dependencies once here, then once over here, and then once copying over. <laughs> I think Scala has fixed this. <laughs> uh, but this is what a good constructor looks like. You know, you just say, I need a whole bunch of these things. It's somebody else's problem on how do you get there. Um, so what have we learned? We, we learned that the new operators are really the thing that gets you. Uh, um, if you need it, then you must interact with it. So what does that mean? Um, I don't have a slide. The slide was too far back ago. But in, um, in the original code, there was, we were asking, for, for example, for config. And we really weren't interacting with the config. All we were doing is we were getting stuff out of it. Right? Uh, and so the rule is to, to not be violating a law of Demeter, you must be sending a message for to other object to do something rather than sending it a getter. Right? That, that doesn't count. So uh, passing in a config and then having the other object say config.getUserName just so I can take the username and pass it to the, uh, the, uh, uh, the pop connector so the pop connector can connect to, on my behalf is kind of very convoluted. Rather, you should just say, look, I just need a pop connector, and it's not really my problem how you construct one. It's somebody else's business. And then whoever constructs it uh, should be pa uh, passing in the username and password and certificate as well. Do factories validate all these? Do factories validate all these? Uh, you can be basically more lenient with them, right? Because they're, oh, sorry. The question was, do factories violate law of the emitter? Because you don't really interact with them. And to some degree, I mean, you, you, the factories shouldn't because you're just instantiating a whole bunch of things and passing it back in. But sometimes you really have to say, well, get that object from over there and pass it over here. So to some degree, you can be lenient about law of limiter violations in, in factory code, but not too lenient. Uh, even there, it just looks kind of uh, suspicious. This was the second question over there? No? OK. Uh, Oh yeah, and lastly, doing work in constructor is just a bad idea because constructor is one method that I cannot override. It's the method that I absolutely have to call every time I want to call uh, instantiate any call any method on an object. And so, if you put work in the constructor, you're basically saying that every time you want to do something with this object, you better be prepared to go through whatever that constructor wants to do. And if that constructor wants to read certificates or wants to you know, send emails, well, then you're stuck. You're, you're sending emails and you're reading certificates. So the last piece is that what we talked about is we talked about unit testing, which is on individual levels all the way at the bottom. But the same rules also apply for end-to-end -end tests. Uh, to give you an idea, a unit test is to end-to-end -end test as classes are to components. So if my classes follow proper dependency injection so that I can instantiate individual classes, then I should also be able to do the same thing for components. So if I have an application, I don't know, I'm going to use Gmail as an example. If I have an application like Gmail, I should be able to say, uh, in the end-to-end -end test, I am going to remove the authentication component and then replace it with a uh, fake, always authenticated component. So when my end-to-end -end tests run, I don't have to worry about logging in. And that's Another form of dependency injection, uh, but really just slightly higher level. So just like your individual classes need to be uh, properly managed and you can replace them through dependency injection, the same rule really has to apply to uh, components. And it turns out that if you do uh, class injection properly, then you get the component injection kind of for free. Uh, so if you do your unit testing properly, then your end-to-end -end test should just kind of fall into place. Uh, so what are components? Well, just well-defined boundaries, like I just pointed out, like being able to replace the authenticator with something else, or maybe the persistent engine with something else, or something like that. Uh, your app should really be global state free, uh, because global state is going to haunt you, whether it's with unit tests or end-to-end -end tests or at any level. You really don't want to have any. Uh, and last piece is that when you are testing uh, unit tests, you know, we kind of went to the idea of creating a BSL out of your variables so that you can easily write sentences. That is even more important with end-to-end -end tests because when in end-to-end -end tests, usually you want to tell a very complicated story. 
Well, in a unit test, you might say something very simple, like if I have an account and I deposit five bucks to it, then the account should have now, you know, if the account started with five dollars, I deposit five dollars, I should have ten dollars in there now. That's an easy story to tell. But if you have an end-to-end test, uh, the stories you're going to tell are much, much more complicated. You're probably going to say a story along the lines of, oh, the user logs in as uh, you know, into his Gmail account, and then he checks the inbox, and then if he sees an unread message, he clicks on it, and then that unread message, then when he goes back to the inbox, should no longer be showing as unread, but it should be showing as read. And then he should be able to unread it. It's a very complicated story, and unless you have a very good DSL, a good domain-specific language of telling the stories, you're going to get lost in the process of, of building your end-to-end -end tests. Uh, last thing is, I oftentimes demo uh, how I do test-driven development. And so I usually show up at, at a meeting and you know I have an Eclipse going or whatever your favorite IDE is, and I start typing, and I hit save, and all of a sudden my tests run. And what that really means is you really have to spend time on making your environment easy for you so that it doesn't fight you, right? Uh, and, and I oftentimes forget that I have maybe spent you know, four hours trying to get Eclipse to behave properly so that when I do a demo, to the students or whoever I'm giving the demo to, uh, they kind of see, oh look, if you hit save, it just magically runs, right? But that magical part is actually the hard part. Uh, when we're talking about being able to write tests, it's not just being able to write tests, it's also being able to set up your whole environment that the, the environment doesn't fight you every step of the way in writing those tests. Uh, and that's the kind of the tricky part of the whole business. So that when you set everything up, of course it's easy, right? If you come to a project where everybody does this thing and you're a new kid on a block and they just say, look how easy to write a test, and then you say, well, it takes me three lines of code to write a test or I can start a server, which takes 30 seconds, and then I can go and log in, which takes another 30 seconds, and then I go to inbox and I click on the message and I can verify that you know, um, the, the me message is no longer unread but it's read, or I could just line, run three lines of code, of course the person's gonna write three lines of code because it's easier, right? But getting to that point is something that, that is a lot of effort and it's a lot of know-how. So a lot of times when you're talking about having, doing test-driven development, it's this unspoken thing that nobody talks about, which is that how do you get your environment set up so that these things are natural, so that it's the easiest thing for you to do? And, and that's not exactly simple or easy. And sometimes finding the right tools is, is tricky. So I want to talk about one last thing, which I call the theory of bugs. Yes? Can I ask a quick question? Yes. Um, I'm not even using this problem in my group. When um, I started testing as an intern at IBM, we were testing in two different environments, Viacom Meatloaf, which is the back end mm -hmm. of WebSphere. Mm -hmm. And the problem was I was giving them like a, a, a jar file that was in Python mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how do you do that when you're testing in multiple environments that happen to be software as well as the web, where you right. have to test in different... Um, so you're asking an open-ended question of, you know, we were in a situation where it's hard to test, what do you do? Unfortunately, there isn't one magical answer I can give you. It's, um, it's basically fighting it, the environment, trying to figure out some kind of a harness or something to make your life easy, and there aren't really easy answers to it. Um, it, there, there just has to be this goal and this vision in it that you have to have that is, if I somehow solve all these problems, and for every project these set of problems are different, then, and I get to this happy place, then it, life makes sense and it's easy. But getting there is always the, the tricky part. And unfortunately, I don't know, or can't really help you on an individual basis. Did you? Thank you. Mm -hmm. If you're testing hardware, even mechanical hardware, you have to build it with testing at every step. Yes. If you have to build, if you want to see the new parts take you back another 150, 200 years, if you want these sustainable new parts, you need machine tools. Yes. You can't do it by hand. Mm -hmm. If you do it by hand, you won't <coughs> have any sustainable parts. Mm -hmm. If you don't have any sustainable parts, you can't patch test it. Yes. So the thing you're bringing up is that uh, the cost of making a mistake in hardware world and in anything but software is just so expensive that people have no choice but to test. Unfortunately, in the software world, 
cost of making the mistake is that feeling you get like, oh, if I just fix this, everything's going to work. And then you just iterate on it for three months, right? Yes. The large case is difficult to do by hand. Yep. However, along that path and once in meandering path from A to B, it's not clear that there's a bright line at any point that says here's the cliff. No, there isn't a cliff. Yes. Yeah, it is. Incrementally, it's no problem, no problem, until it's wham. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, there's no cliff. You're right. That's a good way of putting it. The cliff is clear in retrospect. Yes. Which is always so why it's so hard to sell somebody any idea of testing because there's this mountain in front of you and I'm saying, look, if you just climb the mountain, on the other side there's a paradise. Yes. Absolutely. Testing is something that has to be baked in from the moment you start writing a first line of code. You have to think about, what am I going to do to test this thing? And really, better yet, you need to have the harness ready before you write the first line of code. Because then you don't have to say, well, am I sure that this design is actually testable? You know it because you wrote the test first, and then you're writing the implementation. So the test and the design are kind of interconnected. They are very much interconnected. And that's something that people uh, fail to acknowledge, especially when they have this attitude that you can just sprinkle the test after the fact to the code base. And you just can't do that. Mm -hmm. is easy to do up front as part of your boilerplate and is viciously productive. Yes. So let me finish a couple of slides, and then we can throw this into an open-ended conversation. I promise I only have about five or so more slides. Uh, so I call this the theory of testing, and that is I think there are three different kinds of bugs. So one bug kind of bug is what I call the scorpion, which is you thought about the problem and you thought wrong. And so it's a thinking mistake, right? The other kind of problem is you, you got the pieces right, but you miswired it. Like you got yourself a stereo system and you got yourself a TV, but you plug the input to the output. I wouldn't call it really as a thinking mistake. It's just you happen to miswire the pieces together. And that happens sometimes. That's a, that's a, that's a wiring problem. And finally, uh, the ladybug problem, which is you put it together and it just looks funny. <laughs> And this is your UI, right? Like you put it together, it just eh, it doesn't quite look right. And, and uh, why do we, when we talk about these three different tests, is because each one of these kinds of bugs can be caught by a different kinds of test. The thinking problem is really your if statements and your loops. And that's where unit testing is really wonderful at, which is I have a class, and there's a whole bunch of complicated if statements and loops and logic, and I want to make sure that I test those particular things. And so unit testing over there is, is, what, is what the doctor has ordered. Once you know that individual pieces work together, you could have very well miswired the factories, right? Unit tests don't help with that. What you need is kind of an end-to-end -end or at least medium-level test that the test to make sure that the pieces work together. And so this is where end-to-end -end comes in. And that basically verifies that the, at least the happy paths work. Because if I can get the system up, like I like to use the example of a car, uh, you know, if you put the car together and, and on the end of the line, if they put the key in and they start and they drive it to the parking lot, chances are they got the right parts in the right places, right? I mean, for the most part, you know, the, the battery's there, the fuel's there, it's hooked up properly, the engine's there, the brake's there. So for the most part, it looks like nothing got forgotten. You don't know whether the car will perform at some really cold temperatures or will it be perform, you know, on with the ABS work and all the other stuff, but hopefully there are other unit tests that kind of proved that Yes, the brake system works when it's minus 10 degrees or something like that. Uh, and so really we're just interested if the pieces got put, put together properly. And so that's what unit tests are for. They're really not meant to make sure that every single scenario uh, works. They're really meant to be that the basic flow works because that proves to us that we got wired this thing together properly. The last one, I don't have an answer for you because that's like the font color is off or you know it looks weird when... Uh, it's on some weird angle mo monitor, or maybe when you translate it to a different language, it doesn't look right. And so unfortunately, there is no test for this. This is still humans. We can't really automate this thing. But there's a good news, and that is 
the probability of finding a particular bug of a, of a particular category and the cost of fixing this particular bug is different. So logical bugs, they're really, really, um, the probability of you finding a logical bug is really high. You make lots of them every day, you fix lots of them every day, you probably don't want to think about it because you, as you're changing the code around. The, the difficulty of finding it is actually hard. Like if something doesn't work and only under some corner cases, it's really uh, difficult to find this thing. And then when you find it and fix it, the probability that you introduce the new bug is actually quite high. So luckily for these set of bugs, the logical set of bugs, you know, we have unit tests, and that's what verifies us that everything is kind of working and we're not regressing. The wiring bugs, this is the end-to-end -end test, right? Chances are usually they're kind of easier to find because if you miswire, usually the whole system just crashes spectacularly. Like it's not like a logical bug where only on leap year, on the end of the year, at 12 o'clock, the system doesn't work, right? Uh, the wiring problem, if usually if you have one, the system just doesn't come up. It throws an exception on the main method or something crazy like that. And so fixing those is much easier, finding them is much easier, and when you fix it, chances that of you introducing a new bug is actually quite low. The rendering bugs are the easiest to kind of the spot to fix, but there is no real way of making sure that we don't reintroduce them, right? That's kind of the end of it. But when I explain that, people say, well, my code is different. You know, I have a super bug. That's because you mixed all the concerns, right? The reason I could have three different kinds of tests is because my code was either responsible for wiring or what was responsible for logic. I didn't mix it together, or I had you know, the rendering UI, whatever the view templating system you have happens with. I didn't mix the pieces together. When you mix the pieces together, all bets are off, right? You have the super bug where it's a rendering and a wiring problem and a logical problem all tied together. Okay, that's everything. Uh, so i open to questions if you have any, yes? Yeah, so I have two questions. Yes. That's always the question always comes up. <laughs> uh, so the best way that I can come up with is that you separate it into two problems. One is there's the problem of uh, being the traffic up, making sure your, 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 your threads don't deadlock and making sure the right stuff is happening at the right moment. That's a deadlock problem or rather the traffic up problem. And then the second problem is the actual work that you have to do. Uh, so you need to structure your code in such a way that these, you can schedule the threads in any point in time so that you can simulate what happens if this thing runs first and that thing runs first. And that really means that you have to separate the scheduling from the actual logic that is happening inside of the scheduled blocks. I mean, well, the way that I wanted to approach it is I wanted to do the spec search, right? Mm -hmm. Something like that. There is really no good, easy answer. Uh, Yes, and it's get, it, what you're doing is you're you're uh, you're having flakiness, right? Because even if you you test sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. It doesn't prove anything. So threads are hard, and there is no yeah, hard question. But to digress a little bit, I think the answer to your problem might be something like Node.js. How many people are familiar with Node.js? And interesting there is uh, you have a single threaded system, therefore these problems don't exist. And instead of scheduling, you have uh, callbacks that execute, there's evented system, and you're guaranteed that each callback happens uh, by itself exclusively, so you don't really have any thread locking issue, and so there you can, uh, you don't really have this particular problem, but that's digressing. So uh, the answer to the question is, look into Node.js, maybe that's what you're looking for. Yes. Uh, so you can have a little, uh, uh, micro benchmark test in your code. Uh, those are trickier, uh, so I usually have a separate uh, test suite that runs them, so they don't, they don't pollute the, but there's no reason why you can't say, you know, I should be able to run 10,000 operations in a second, and then just run it for 10,000 operations, measure the time. Yeah, it might be flaky, because if you set the threshold too early, right? Um, but the other thing that you might want to do is you might want to collect these numbers. So one thing is to fail a test uh, outright, the other thing which you can do is you collect these numbers and then you put them on your continuous build and you, you make a chart. 
if you use Hudson, it's actually there's a plugin for Hudson that allows you to collect these things and, and, and draw them. So as long as your tests produce some kind of a properties file that has all these numbers of performance, then you can chart them and then you can see as, as, as commits go in to see if any of them uh, regression tests. Yeah, it's kind of a visual. So there's really no 100% guaranteed way. I think you were first. Uh, do you prefer mocks or objects? Uh, do I prefer mocks or objects? Ah, that's always a religious debate. <laughs> uh, I, I guess uh, you can say that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm the kind of a guy who likes state-based testing uh, to some degree. Uh, I think mocks are, are, are good and you should use them. I have a couple of these rules that if you're going to have use mocks, you should never have more than two mocks involved in a, in a test. And then if you're going to have expectations on these mocks, then you shouldn't have more like than three expectations per mock. If you're doing anything more complicated than that, you're doing it wrong. And if a mock returns a mock, if you train a mock to return another mock, you're doing it wrong again. Uh, but in general, I find that I don't really use mocks that often. I much rather pre prefer to do state-based testing, which is that I put the state in the known uh, situation, like, oh, the account has $10. And then I perform a story on it, which is you know add some money to it, subtract, and add interest or whatever. And then I assert that now the account has a particular amount of money uh, on it. I, I don't know whether it's like a pref personal preference or is actually better or not. So I mean I heard arguments both ways, but that's just what I do. I'm sorry. Test vector. Test vector. Okay. Yep. I think you had a question over there, right? Really? What team are you on? <laughs> yes, it is in a way like that. Um, so business analysis and all these things are important and uh, it's really outside of the scope or of a discussion. Uh, the, the discussion really starts with when a PM or whoever knows whoever knows what needs to be built comes to you and says, we need to build an email program, right? And it should have the following set of features. Then you can turn those features into uh, specs or stories, and then the stories is what you end up writing. And it turns out that as you're writing the spec, you're indirectly designing the code because you're saying, well, this class needs to do X. In order to do X, it needs to collaborate with this other concept over here. And so I'm instantiating these concepts and wiring it together. And in the process of it, you're really doing a design. Uh, because you're looking at it like, what does the API look like? You're, you're, you're starting from the user point of view. Like, what does the, the API look like? And then I'm going to backtrack and do the implementation, which is very different than doing the implementation and then really having accidental uh, or incidental APIs is what most of the code has. It, it's all mixed in together. Like, I don't really see boundaries for it. It's like you write a little code, you write a little test, you run some tests, you, something breaks, you fix it. It's just a continuous iterative process. I have no idea. <laughs> I'm really the wrong person to ask about that. Uh, uh, but I'm assuming you're referring to Android. Uh, uh, I believe that there is a company called uh, Pivotal, and they have a uh, testing framework for Android called something robot, electric robot, electric sheep, something, uh, I can't remember what it is. Uh, but they did some whole bunch of interesting work around, the, around testing Android stuff. I can't remember the name, though. It's something about electric and something about robot. Roboelectric, Robo -electric? there you go. Roboelectric, it's called. Robo yes. Yes. What advice do I have somebody for somebody who's interning in quality assurance testing? 
Uh, I don't have a specific advice, but my general advice is that a good way to learn all these things is to be part of some open source project. Uh, and the reason for that is because you can try all kinds of different things. You can kind of experiment. And you know, the worst thing that's going to happen is they're not going to accept your patch. And you don't really have some time pressure or anything like that, like, which happens in most companies. So where I learn most of my stuff and I, where I see the people that I talk to, where they learn most of their stuff is really on <laughs> open source projects when they try different things and try to add testability to it. So my general advice is be part of open source and try to do something. And in the process of doing so, you'll probably discover and learn from other people. Yes. You know, I, I want to make a more general statement about what you just said. It, it is that there's something interesting about engineers in general, and that is that they're really, I don't know if they're afraid, or there's something about saying, I don't know, that they're having troubles with, right? And there's nothing wrong with saying that because there's so much information out there, like, you don't know most of it, and you just have to accept it. So a lot of times when I actually, especially with, with interns and younger people who are new to uh, work, I always find is that, they are really having a hard time asking for and saying, look, I just don't know, I need some help. And that's really the best way to learn. Just swallow your pride and say, yeah, I need it. Help me out. And you'll learn all kinds of stuff from there. Ah, that's a tough one. Because you're, now you're, really, it's not a, what you're asking is not an engineering question. So the question was, how do you inject uh, uh, process into an organization? And that's not an, Engineering problem. That's a people problem. <laughs> um, on the technical side, it's easy. Get a, some kind of a dependency injection system. Um, if you're working in Java, I, I like Juice, but there's other ones, Spring, and I uh, um, uh, can't think of the name right now. Pick a container, thank you. Uh, both are very good. Um, they're about, all about the same in terms of capabilities, so uh, you can't go wrong with any of them. And, and just start at one location of the code base and slowly grow it. And then people will slowly see, oh yeah, that piece of code base looks much nicer, it's more testable, and just slowly as you need more and more things, just grow it from there. From a people sign, uh, point of view, um, for a while what I was doing at Google is actually, a, there was a group called Test Mercenaries, which we went from group to group and we try to inject these practices, as you say, into the team. It's very, very difficult. It's very um, project specific because each team has different kinds of hangups or different things, different problems that they're faced with. Uh, but in general, what works is that uh, pairing with people works tremendously. Just, you know, instead of arguing about some arbitrary, not real thing, sit behind a keyboard. Uh, sometimes you have to trick them. And uh, sit two people behind one keyboard solving one problem and just uh, work on the one problem together. In the process of working this out, all kinds of questions come up. And instead of talking about it in general things, you can talk about it in concrete things that you're actually doing on a code base. So that is by far the only thing that I know of that works. And expect it to take a long time. Yes. It, <laughs> If you, if you must call it that, yes, but it's sometimes a dirty word, especially in corporations. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, you can actually get two keyboards, and USB keyboards, they work together, and you can fight over the mouse. <laughs> <coughs> uh, yes, you, it's called extreme programming sometimes, or agile. Again, so you're asking this general open-ended question, and uh, it's, it's very specific to what you're doing and what you're building. So what is what we might advise is choose a framework that where they thought about testability, right? So what would be an example of extremes? So for example, Ruby, and I'm not saying Ruby is the answer. I'm just saying Ruby and Rails, they spent a lot of time making sure that they have a testability story. So Rails, I think part of the success of Rails is the very fact that not only do they 
uh, give you a language and a framework, but they also give you the whole methodology. Say, so, you know, if you're building a Rails application, this is where you put the controllers, this is where you put your test, this is how you run the test, this is how the whole thing is broken up, and it's all laid out for you so that you can just kind of go ahead and start it. On the other hand, if you choose a different framework, uh, let me think of one. Uh, what was the thing popular in Java for a while, a long time ago, so I don't uh, Struts, for example. Struts didn't, never really came with any testability story. Like, it was just a framework by itself, right? And so already, you know, it's harder for you because if that's what you're introducing to the company, not only do people have to learn Struts, but now you also have to introduce some kind of a testability story. And given that Struts was not written with probably testability in mind, you're going to have a much harder time doing it. So my advice is just choose pieces that, that, that uh, have already testability story in there. So I'm, my hoping is that as, as the industry evolves, basically we realize that when frameworks are being done, uh, the testability story of that framework really is just feature just like anything else. And so I'm hoping that when, when people are going to be choosing framework A over framework B, one of the features would be, hey, does the framework have tests? What's the coverage? And do they have a story for both unit testing and end-to-end -end testing? Oh, to make sure you have a testability story. <laughs> uh, part of the framework that you're building should really be, how do I test different pieces? Like, you should think about it from day one. Uh, it's not something that you really, your users should be figuring out. You need to deliver to them not just a framework, but also a story of how you're going to test this thing. I'm oh, sorry, can you speak up? I'm having a hard time. There's a, oh, there's a microphone coming your way. Check, check. Um, applications that are cross-platform, how would you test for that if you have environments that? Cross-platform. Uh, you mean like a, uh, that you have to test on multiple browsers? Multiple browsers or even that new application that allows you to develop one application that will work on multiple phones. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think it really comes down to the same story. I'm sorry, I'm going to sound like a broken record. And that is that you need to have a testability story with it. So if you have a choice between two frameworks, you know, one is promising that they have a testability story and the other one isn't, that makes, that should be part of your decision making process. And if, you, if, if you're going to choose a framework that doesn't have it, you really should part of the whole design process, you figure out like how am I going to test this thing. If it's a web browser, maybe you can use something like Selenium for end-to-end -end test, and then can I write my classes for that particular framework in such a way so that uh, there is a testing story involved in this as well. Uh, maybe you, if, if you, for example, choose a framework that you absolutely have to use but it doesn't have a good testability story, for example, servlets are a perfect example of that. Uh, testing a servlet is next to impossible. And part of the reason is because the server, uh, the, 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 the method, for example, do get or do post, takes HTTP request and HTTP response. And then instantiating that class is next to impossible, and that requires other things. And so this cascading things, like pulling on a sweater, and just like the end never comes. Uh, on a thread in a sweater, right? Uh, so in that case, what you need to do is you need to build a tiny layer between yourself and the framework that, re <laughs> that presents the testability for you. So if you're going to, if you, for example, decide that servlets are the answer, and the first thing you need to do is build a really thin layer, almost like a veneer between your code and the servlet so that your code never talks to these offending objects like HTTP request and HTTP response, uh, because those things will be causing troubles for you later on. Dev data. Oh, I see what you're saying. You're saying that if you want to do an end-to-end -end testing, um, you probably want to have some data sets to kind of, yeah, sorry, that's kind of a little out of my, uh, what I focus on, because my focus really is on unit tests, and you're really asking an end-to-end -end question, and don't, don't really have a good story for you there, sorry. Where's the, or 
or a request response, mm -hmm. or I can create like a default constructor for server mm -hmm. and instantiate. With, uh, instantiate and Is it reasonable to use that, right? Yeah. Um, yes and no. Um, it is reasonable because it's better than what you had, but in the long term, you don't want to be mocking out or stubbing out HTTP request and HTTP response, right? Because get back to this example we had over here. If I had a user class, and suppose a user uh, asks for a cookie as the constructor, and so a Spring Framework comes along and says, no, no worries, we got a cookie, fake cookie for you that you can make. Now it becomes this troublesome thing because you got to make the fake cookie, and then you have to compute the cookie because cookie is just a string. You got to put the string into the cookie instantiate the user, and then hope that the user reads the cookie and then probably talks to the database in order to get the user data, right? It's this convoluted way, like it's testable, but it's not clean. So a much better design is to say, no, 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 user class is just a value object, it is not responsible for reading its state, right? Put that information somewhere else, and then have the user simply take a string, which is the username. So now if you have a, a third class called authenticator, and it says, I need a user, it's a piece of cake to instantiate because you just make a user, set the username, and you're done. Uh, so these, these uh, patches that we have that allow you to instantiate hard to test objects like servlets and cookies, et cetera, they're better than nothing, but really they're not gonna solve, uh, save you from death by a thousand cuts because yeah, it's a little less miserable, but it's still miserable. Mishka, we have a question over here. Yes. Hi, my guess is uh, it's a bit, uh, uh, surprising maybe it's I hardly have specs or requirements or cases mm -hmm. and uh, my application is like a software for emergency departments in the hospitals mm -hmm. and they used to hire like a, a clinical nurses who have uh, smart enough who are smart enough uh, technically also mm -hmm. so now they want an automation application so that's why uh, they hired me mm -hmm. so it's not exactly an automation they want an auto magic <laughs> so they want me to perform everything. Yes. So they hardly have specs or recs or test cases. So what do you suggest? Uh, which framework do you want me to follow? Do you want me to write a test cases first or directly no, so the, the scenarios? Right. So <laughs> you have a bootstrapping problem, right? Like how do I get myself going over here? And uh, in a situation like that, you know, test first make, has no meaning. What it really comes down to is, Step one, I need to figure out a way to write an automated whatever, right? And that might be a really hard thing, and maybe, uh, maybe it might be something else. If it's a web app, maybe you can look into Selenium, which means the only thing you have is end-to-end. -end it's a .NET application or it's a desktop web? application. It's a desktop application. And I'm sure there are some kind of robots that will pretend to be user clickers. Uh, yeah, it's a horrible I use QTP way. for record and replay thing, but that doesn't work at all. Right, so that doesn't really yeah. work, and the reason for that is because you don't want to do record and replay. What you want to do is you want to build up a DSL. You want to save yourself, like, you want to say, go click on patient details, right? And that method should go figure out where the button is and do the right stuff, et cetera. It's, it's not the best solution because really what you want to do is you want to be a, low, a layer below it, which is that you want to say, forget the UI, I'm just talking directly to the controller object and calling the right method on it to verify that the right data is being loaded. But given the fact that it probably was written without the stability in mind, it might be the only option that you have. There were no tests before. It was a FoxPro application and they are upgrading to .NET and it's right. all like cut and paste like patches all over. It's, it's like a help for me. I've been it's, working there for right. two years. So th <laughs> there is no magical, like I said earlier, like there is no magical answer for you, right? It's just, you know, one miserable step after another, like figuring out how I can put some kind of a test framework on it, how I can build some kind of a domain-specific language around what I'm about to test because doing clicks will simply drown, I will drive myself too, too early, you know, in the whole mess of things. So just abstract away from it and just accept the fact that this will probably never be the sexy, super fast application that you can on every save verify everything. Uh, but it is possible through a lot of blood and sweat to get there. Yeah, right now I'm automating in the scenario base, like, you know, they have a test case for, like, you know, issuing an order, completing an order. Yeah, yeah so that's important to have stories, like I said earlier. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yes. Um, I was just going to say more about how I got into testing. I mean, uh, I'm sure almost everyone in the room has done this, where you're running some piece of code and you're looking at the console or you're looking at web page, and you put uh, some sort of print line system or something like that, 
and you're looking for a value. So you're doing a test there. You're expecting some kind of value. So if you run that even once, or and certainly if you run it more than once, you might as well write the same amount of code as a test, where you say, instead of expecting to see this on the screen, you just, in a test, you say, this is the value I expect when I put this value into a method. And I, I got started in a very small way, just where, just testing a handful of tiny methods that are really simple. And it's gradually built up and built up on the, on the project I'm doing. I have hundreds of tests now. And it, to me, that's a much better um, kind of metric for how successful the project is and how much progress I've made. Because I've actually, each one of those tests tests something real, which I really want to happen in the system. Yes. Um, and the other thing I'd say as well is to try, uh, it, when you start off, it's quite easy to end up testing things that isn't your code. So uh, you end up testing libraries and things like that. So really think about it. It's where your own logic is. It's what, what is it that your code should be doing rather than sort of testing whether it will get something out of the database because hopefully your uh, ORM is well tested already. You know, that's a great story. And if anybody else has also a story great, like that to share. Also a great instruction test. Yes. Yeah. Do you have a story? I have a technical question. Yes. The question was, do you have any text or papers or books that you would recommend that expound upon this subject well? And you're grimacing as I asked that. Uh, there are good books. Igor, do you, can you suggest something? <laughs> yeah, I think that's from JavaScript development, if you're doing JavaScript. Uh, there was another one, Growing Object-Oriented Software Through Tests, I think it was called. Uh, there's always my blog. Uh, <laughs> also, another Googler, James Whitaker, has written James a couple Whitaker, of books. James Whitaker, yes. Whitaker with two Ts. That's right. Uh, there's a lot of material on the internet. 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 There's a lot of material on the uh, yes. Yeah, so I, I personally found uh, the Google Java Reviewer's Guide very useful. Uh, so I really recommend that one. I have this bug in my Mac that if it wakes up sometimes, I don't have a keyboard. But if I put it to sleep and wake it up again, the keyboard comes back. <laughs> yes. Um, I work at an agency where we do a lot of web development on the server side and front end, and mm -hmm. our automated builds are really good at uh, testing every time there's a check-in. However, we have problems with uh, the front end and the JavaScript code. Is there anything that you know of or Google might use to emulate a web browser or a DOM or a JavaScript rendering engine? So we can actually uh, test our... Right, so you have a couple of choices. One is uh, something like Selenium, right? That's an end-to-end -end runner. Uh, what else? I mean, for web driver, Selenium kind of what it is for end-to-end. -end. It depends what you want it to assert, right? Do you want to assert that the page looks, renders properly, or do you want to assert that the when I click a button, the right stuff happens, right? So there, there are different um, extremes over there. So a good framework would help with rendering. Uh, again, a little shameless plug. So I'm working on a project called AngularJS. Uh, there we focus quite a lot on testability and also making sure that rendering is easy. So again, it's just a choice of your framework that helps a lot um, in, that, in that situation. That's the URL. I'm not sure why my internet's not working, but that's the URL. I thought I have, but uh, I don't know why it's not running. Um, uh, yes. Let's see what's going on with my network. Sorry, um, I'm going to try to be back in. Uh, other questions? Yes, back oh. there. Oh, yeah. Uh 
asynchronous communication. I'm just wondering, or is there at least a design pattern for sandboxing that so that it doesn't yeah, impact Yeah, so the general answer to that is, it's always the, uh, everybody has a, like, you know, like I showed you the super bug on the end, right? Everybody's like, yeah, my code's different, I got this big problem. And usually what it comes down to is, uh, you're doing too many things and you need to decompose it, right? So break this down into smaller problems and then the smaller problems usually are testable. Uh, and these very specific questions, it really comes down to, you know, somebody on a team really caring about it and spending a lot of time trying to figure out, like, how can I break this thing down so that different concerns are separated so that I can test these things in pieces? So we've, got some, we've got a question over the other side of the room. Go ahead. As well. Hi. Um, I'm a TDD noob. I'm a veteran of the Cowboy Camp of Coding. And mm -hmm. um, I have a project up. I'm right over here. Oh. <laughs> Uh, I've got a project upcoming, which is just me, and it's about two weeks long. It's an ideal candidate to actually sort of do this for the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in Python, uh, and I'm planning on using Django for it. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anybody out here who, who's uh, built a, or built a lot of TDD stuff with Django or Python that could suggest maybe a quick start path, something that I could look into to, uh, to actually running and learning uh, during the course of this two-week project? Anybody have any suggestions? I, I'm not a Python guy. Um, <laughs> when I'm trying to learn new languages or anything like that, I usually try the, um, like, they call them like, uh, like Python challenges where you have to write a code to fix what they're looking for. Um, you can look them up on Google, um, Python Challenge. Um, they, they give you a, a scenario where you have to um, decode something, and you have to write a Python code to fix it or to decode their, their code. Um, there's a lot of them like that. Like um, When I was learning about um, security, I went to hackthesite.org, and it will show you how to write how things are hacked, so that way you learn how to secure it. Um, and they got different levels and stuff like that. Um, I did the Python one where you had to decode a, 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 a layer of, of, of um, code it, um, and you had to translate it back to English to know how, how it worked. And you had to use Python to fix that problem. Um, it's called the Python challenge. So to add to that, uh, this might not be obvious, is that it's, a lot of people when they start to do unit testing, they somehow come to it from the point of view, I gotta test the whole system end to end, right? And uh, try to give up on that idea and rather say, start small and say, hey look, there's this tiny little method that almost does nothing, it sorts people by age, right? Can I write a small little test that basically uh, asserts that that method works properly? Maybe this is part of a larger web application that allows you manipulating your address book, and that's one of the features to sort them by uh, birth date. And that's a method, right? So start small. Start saying, hey, can I write a test for such, such a utility method? And then maybe you can grow from there and say, well, can I write a test to read from the database? And can I write a test for a controller such that I can replace the real database with fake database? And that really would usually will force you to restructure the code so that you can decouple the controller or the behavior of a page from the, uh, the, the persistent storage. All along, what you're doing is you're not really doing any kind of assertions about the UI because, as I said, UI is really difficult to test and it's hard, right? So don't try to pretend to be that you're the user and writing an end-to-end -end test. Usually that's more than, than, than it's worth fighting for. Rather, start small and slowly build up kind of experience and get better at it and grow it. And then over time, when you have this experience, you'll be able to say, well, this is worth testing and maybe this one is more effort than it's worth or I can do some trade-offs or maybe it's just the UI or something like that and then maybe have an end-to-end -end test framework added to the mix. So it really is a continuous process that you just simply get better at it over time. It's not just some magical thing that just happens, right? We've got time for maybe two more questions. Okay. Right. 
and as you go, and then it's all try to push the limits and get it. Sorry, the question was, uh, he's saying, start with the most trivial methods and then grow from there to get methods that are more and more complicated. And the answer is yes, that's exactly how you learn. You just get better and better at it, you know. Stuff that even the most trivial uh, method to test will require you to have some kind of a test harness, require you to have ability to run this thing in a continuous fashion, to run it maybe on a regular basis, to manage your tests, and as the tests grow, to have some kind of a strategy for it. And all of these are learnings that you're going to gather as you're, as you're doing this. Uh, and all of these are kind of unspoken things that in the background that you just have to know how to manage this process. Uh, and, and you can learn it whether it's something complicated or something simple. So start small and then just grow it from there. So two more questions. Uh, I think we already asked. Uh, wait, you guys all had a, who, who, has, who has a chance to speak? Okay, sorry. I thought she did. <laughs> Double testing versus QA testing, yes. Uh, so my thought is that uh, developers absolutely have to write tests, and their job is to write unit tests. Uh, the second level would be the QA. So there's two kinds of QA. There is uh, what I would call exploratory QA, which is that uh, you have a system, and you, nobody really wants to be that guy who reads the script and goes clicks on it, right? You want to automate it. You don't want to have that. But, but it is useful to have people, and especially some people are better than others, that are really twisted about, hey, can I enter some crazy value into this thing? This is exploratory testing, right? And when they discover something, ideally, you want to turn that into another story inside of your reservoir of tests. That's one kind of testing. The other kind of thing is what, at least in Google, we call um, SCT software engineer in test. And their job is to worry more about the end-to-end -end harnesses and the frameworks, right? So as an engineer, uh, as a software engineer, my responsibility is to write the unit test. Uh, I think a good engineer should also worry about how the end-to-end -end framework uh, should work. But in this situation, it is used to, useful to have specialists to basically come in and say, OK, if you've done your unit testing story properly, then let me help you write an end-to-end story and then it's everybody's responsibility to add to the reservoir of the end-to-end -end test. But it's really a different kind of a thing. So that's kind of how the breakdown should happen in theory and practice. You know, things are slightly different always. And one last question. Thank you for the talk. Uh, my question is based on uh, there's a lot of legacy code right now existing in uh, Oracle PL SQL. Uh, do you have any advice on uh, setting up a test harness for that and testing for that? PL SQL? Uh, well, if I was faced with that, right, uh, the first thing I would try to figure out is write a set of scripts so that I can bring up a database with a reset and a reset its state into a known state, uh, probably an empty state, and then have some kind of a harness that can go and write and read into that database and then build up s scenarios from there. This, what you're describing is very much an end-to-end -end test, right? Uh, and it comes down to I need to build some way of executing a set of SQLs so that I can create scenarios. And once I have scenarios, I'm going to drown because it's nothing but a whole bunch of SQLs. So I need some kind of a domain-specific language so I can tell stories. So it really is kind of a progression. Can I execute SQL? If so, can I turn it into stories uh, next level up? I think we're out of time. Howard? Yeah, exactly. So please, everyone, please help me uh, thank Mishko for coming out. It was a pleasure.